on behalf of my co-organizer, David Eckel. We're pleased to introduce uh, Richard Sarnoff from um, New York, speaking to us from New York. Uh, he very kindly agreed to do this. Uh, you will probably know Richard Sarnoff's name from uh, many online interviews and on TV as well as a major player. Um, in the digital uh, media world uh, as well, uh, more recently as being a central player in the Google Books uh, settlement. He is the co-chairman of Bertelsmann Incorporated, Europe's largest media company, and is also president of Bertelsmann uh, Digital Media Investments, um, which um, uh, operates uh, and controls holdings such as Random House and Publishing, RTL and Fremantle and Television, Arvado and Media Services, and Gruner and Yar in Magazines. He's also served until recently as chairman of the Association of American Publishers. His biography is uh, quite extensive and quite um, detailed, so I won't go through the whole thing, except point out a few others, other um, uh, points. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree. This is a particular of interest to people <laughs> at the university level. Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton and an MBA from Harvard University. He also serves on the board of directors of Activision Blizzard Incorporated, as well as non-for-profit organizations, including the Center for Communication, Princeton University Press, uh, which is looking at one of my books, Richard, uh, the American Association of Publishers, and the Bronx Lab School. As I said, he is a central player, uh, was a central player in the Google Book settlement, and is widely knowledgeable in the world about uh, media and um, more recently digital media and its uh, future. So please welcome Richard Sarnoff. <laughs> Richard, we've, we've thank been, you, thank you, we've been, um, over the past hour we've heard um, two very interesting and, um, and, and challenging uh, uh, presentations to this audience, one uh, from uh, Dr. James Tracy, the uh, director of a very prestigious uh, academy uh, in Massachusetts, uh, which recently did away with its hard copy library, um, and um, his talk was a defense of um, a digital library uh, and the um, ways that he has gone about it and the uh, future of this digital library, and he sees digital media as perhaps the most important development really in our world today, one, that's one thing that's going to define the 21st century. And in fact, in a, in a macro perspective, he saw um, and continues to see the um, creation of digital media, particularly in the availability of online books, as one of the three most important events um, in the history of the world. Uh, he was, um, uh, we he had a commentary uh, from, um, uh, uh, Professor Christopher Ricks, a noted um, specialist of T.S. Eliot, the editor of T.S. Eliot's work, as well as uh, one of the great books of, about Bob Dylan's lyrics, uh, a, a professor of, of tremendous uh, stature in the field of literary studies and English, who um, quite predictably def defended uh, the virtues of the book, not simply as uh, the, for the knowledge that reading, traditional reading, imparts um, but also uh, in a way to uh, show the book's longevity and its sustainability. In fact, its, it's robustness and it con continued in, uh, in, in, our, in our own age. And then, in fact, why do we need so many books? Why do we, do we need so much information? Why is it so important to be able to have, at a single click, all of the works of, um, of a certain author and all of that material so quickly and so extensively. So that's where we were, and now um, we will um, come to you. And I, I just wanted to maybe start this out by asking you what you see the next two years looking like um, as we move forward. We've had the Google settlement. It seems to be a some sense of detente in that area, but um, there are many players that are coming up in the, in the world. We have a no number of new products. Um, uh, in recently, we, we have a new product coming out from Barnes & Noble. Uh, Amazon's got content. Google has content. Uh, and so what do the next few years look like, according to you? Okay, thanks. Uh, well, let, let me just start by saying I'll, I'm going to try to address this first from a business standpoint, and then we can take it from a wider cultural and intellectual standpoint following that. From a, from a business standpoint, if you look at where we are today, um, something like, in the traditional consumer business, something like 3% of the market is uh, digital books and something like 97% of the market is printed books. 
uh, that is you know, a signal that this is certainly maybe three times the size it was last year and on a terrific curve, but nowhere near the kind of mass market adoption uh, status that certain other uh, digital media have, whether that you look at music or even uh, the gaming sector, et cetera. So what, we, what we're dealing with right now is the onset of a marketplace, not the maturation of a marketplace. And what's important, uh, I think, to understand from a publisher's perspective is that we are trying a lot of things simultaneously as we uh, grow this marketplace. The first and the most important thing from our standpoint is to grow it in such a way that it doesn't leach over uh, into the market for piracy and become essentially something that has been valued by consumers enough to pay for that no longer becomes valued by consumers because it's available and there's a habit of accessing the material for free. And uh, as we've seen with the development of the music market and to some extent the development of the movie and television market, that may not be an easy transition for us to manage, but it's sort of job one from an industry standpoint to try to safeguard the value of the content vis-a-vis -vis its digitization so that there is a marketplace for this kind of long form textual product over time. And, and that is uh, something that's perhaps aided by the market development so far, which if you look at it today is dominated by Kindle and, and Amazon's reading device in terms of the economics. They are certainly the majority uh, in the consumer book market of, of sales or Kindle sales. Coming up over the next couple of years, we have a plethora of devices, including, of course, the Nook from Barnes & Noble, uh, another reader from Plastic Logic, uh, quite a few other speculated on readers from other companies, including perhaps Apple with the tablet. Um, all of this means we'll have, we hope, a richer and more competitive environment for the digital dissemination of books and that we won't have a single dominant player, for example, and we may have, over time, more uh, standards that we can apply to the market so that the kinds of products that people buy will be transferable from device to device. They will perhaps be in digital lockers that themselves are transferable so that once you buy something in one uh, retail environment, you are not shut out from it if you end up with someone else's device. Um, all of that we have to do while still maintaining a posture so that the consumer is not uh, led toward a piracy alternative because it's so difficult to get their material from one device to another. And that really was one of the motivating factors of piracy in music was that people really wanted to listen to it on portable devices. Uh, you know, and so if they downloaded to a PC, that wasn't the format they necessarily needed to listen to it on. Therefore, the unprotected MP3 ended up being a much more convenient factor, uh, form factor for the consumer than any of the proprietary standards that the music industry or other players came up with at the time. Um, now we're seeing a lot of legitimate music purchases, not just through iTunes, but through other modalities. And, uh, and a lot of those are in unprotected MP3 formats uh, today. So it's sort of the mountain has come back to Mohammed here. But if we look at the next two years of what I expect in terms of a curve, for the consumer book industry, and it's a different curve for college textbooks, and it's a very different curve for El Hai uh, textbooks and materials. But if you look at consumer books uh, and, and certain academic books, I think that curve will continue to perhaps double or triple annually. And so by, let's say, the year 2015, I certainly would not be surprised to see uh, fully a quarter, at least, of, of our business uh, exist in electronic dissemination form, at least on a unit basis and probably on a dollar basis as well. Um, some, you know, have thought the curve will go much slower than that, and by the year 2015, will only be at at 10 or 12 percent. And there are there are some who are uh, aggressive about uh, the onset of this market who feel that it'll be 50 percent of the market by 2015. But if you look at those boundaries. Uh, you know, I think 25% is not a bad guess for that time frame. And if the, if the mechanics of the curve work, you'll be looking at something like, you know, within two years, you'll be looking at something like 
10% uh, or so of the market. It, the rate of growth, of course, declines. The steepness of the curve may decline as, as more and more of the population comes in here. But there are watershed moments that we've seen in a, in a number of other industries. And those watershed moments, uh, we had one of them with the Kindle um, a couple of years ago here. We may have another one with another device. It could be the Apple tablet or something else that comes out next year. Uh, and so they tend to be lumpy. The curves uh, have very steep sections, and then they have plateaus. And uh, you know, I, I think that we are going to be contending with, in any market that digitizes, we'll be contending with far wider access and far, far more modes of access than we ever had before. That's generally positive, unless it ends up being free access. And in the case of the industry, that ends up being a big negative also for authors. Um, so, you know, let me leave the answer there. If you want me to go further and talk about uh, whether the Google settlement or any other things might have an impact on that, I'm happy to do so. Yes, I, I'd like to come back to that in a second. I, I just wanted to ask you a question that relates to this, and that's one is that, so right now, unlike um, music, in which the MP3 file has virtually eliminated all of the other types of formats. I mean, people still buy vinyl, and there are still some releases on vinyl, but it's mostly, you know, for collectors and for you know, and to have it as a as, as a different kind of unit, but not a unit that you would continuously play. The MP3 has really taken that. That's become the industry standard. Right now, in the in the book industry, we still are dealing with a multiple format industry. That there's still a, a, a robust um, um, economic base for hard copy sales. And there's a growing, uh, um, a growing and, and, and curve for for the digital sales. So, in, from from your point of view, whether it's Random House or Crown Books or, or things like that, I know for children, for example, digital digital books are probably not um, is going to be the ones uh, that are perhaps the most the highest. I mean, it, it take away the fundamental idea of storytelling. Who knows? I mean, I, I'm not sure how how that would work. But um, <coughs> but are you going to are you still supporting the hard copy? Um, hard copy book uh, yeah. industry as much, or are you starting to res to pull back from that in favor of the digital industry? How does that work? Well, any any major publisher who pulls back from print because of the onset of electronic is is certainly cutting off uh, their entire body to, sp to spite their their face. I mean, they you know, with ninety seven percent of your business in non digital form, you got to pay attention to non digital. That is where you're actually keeping the lights on. Um, I think there is uh, there are certainly new publishers who want to take special advantage of digital formats and are are investing more in a more outsized fashion in those formats than they are perhaps in print formats. But there is no publisher in the United States who says, OK, here's my, here's how I'm designing to abandon print over the next couple of years. I don't know anyone who has that particular strategy. One thing we have to realize is the hybrid time for this industry is a whole different uh, uh, time scale than the hybrid time is for the music industry. And, and we should just say, by the way, as, as much as you think MP3s are the standard format for music, by far the higher dollars are still from, C, you know, from normal CD sales than they are for MP3s today. Although iTunes is the single largest customer uh, today for most music companies, they are also the vast lion's share of MP3 sales or AAC sales, whichever you want to call it with, with iTunes these days. Um, and, and there are quite a number of players who are still active in the CD marketplace. And you know, if I had to guess, I would say two thirds plus of a music company's revenues is coming from fixed format, non-digital sales. So that hasn't, it's still hybrid there as well. But in books, it's a whole different thing. If you look at uh, um, the cohort, the audience for books, our cohort, as you mentioned, it starts at age zero. It starts with bath books, things you really would not want in digital form. <laughs> it goes up to age 99. Um, you know, there, we have the widest cohort of, of pretty much any media industry. And because of that, the curve on adoption of anything new is going to be much, much slower than something like music, which has its core audience in a 10-year span. And that 10-year span also corresponds to other characteristics, such as familiarity with technology and potentially uh, a kind of a, 
um, a revolutionary mentality. They want to be against the man, and that is, uh, uh, you know, that's an environment that piracy certainly thrives in potentially. We have a whole different uh, set of characteristics in this industry. We are going to be living in a hybrid time, not just for two years, not just for five years, but the curve is really, really extended here. You're probably talking about uh, 15 or 20 years before the majority of revenues uh, switch over to digital because we have people whose habit is so well ingrained with regard to print books that regardless of the quality of devices that come forward, that group, that is maybe the age 60 plus group, uh, is not likely to switch their habits. And we're going to need to, as an industry, continue to service their needs with printed books in hardcover, in paperback, uh, uh, as long as, as that audience is there. And that's a really long time. So we are not planning for a switch to digital. We're planning for a market that's a hybrid market that has digital and has print, and you have to be equally effective publishing both. Thank you. Let's let's return now to the to the Google settlements. Um, for those of us in academia, you know, um, seeing our 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 stuff on on Google Books um, is uh, was a pleasant uh, surprise. Um, even if we only saw seventy five percent of it, um, it, it's also a little bit sobering because we know then that our 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 book is is basically out of print. Um, and or that it's um, available to to Google Books, but it's um, it was a uh, it was something that that showed the enormity and the the, the tremendous uh, depth of of Google that it was pulling out, um, you know, very very arcane titles uh, titles that um, even some major research libraries couldn't buy uh, because of the, the the level of specificity, and so having that available was was um, was a uh, obviously something that. Is, has been great for 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 us, but um, where where is that settlement? How you you've managed that, what I call the, as a detente at this point? Um, how's that? How's the Google Books settlement going to? Well, change? I'll I'll give you the um, the current uh, status, which is we are amending the settlement to represent it to the judge. Uh, we'll represent it to the judge in about ten days, and that amendment will take into consideration some of the objections that were filed associated with the settlement and some of the uh, and the letter that we got from the Justice Department with some of their concerns. And hopefully we will have a, a settlement that is uh, not just acceptable vis-a-vis uh, -vis a, a whole variety of parties and attractive to a whole variety of parties, as I think the original settlement was, but one that the judge will feel um, emboldened to and uh, confident about signing uh, and so that we can move forward. That is uh, where the settlement is. You should know that the Google settlement has no books that are available to be viewed today. So any books that you are seeing today are either from public domain, Google has scanned them, but they're not under copyright any longer, so you can read them to your heart's content, or they're books that came in through the partner program, and Google has 25, 30,000 publishers worldwide that are in the partner program that put our, you know, we put our books in there so that they can be uh, browsed and so that they can, you can see whether this book would serve your interest. And if it does, uh, and you want to read more of it, you have to actually go buy it somewhere. That is the current status of what you can find on Google. When the settlement is turned on, you'll have another vast array of books that will be available to be browsed. Uh, these are all the books that were digitized in these libraries that are still under copyright, but not potentially a part of the partner program, uh, mainly out of print books that uh, perhaps the world has forgotten about to some extent, or the publishers have forgotten about, the authors have forgotten about. And those books will be browsable as well, and those books will actually have commercial models attached to them, where if you want to buy a copy of the book, buy access to the book, uh, that is online, you can do that. Or if you are a library, such as your own university's library, you can subscribe to this vast range of out-of-print books to deepen your library's collection. In, in most libraries, uh, uh, it will deepen the collection to the extent of a multiplier of what it currently has. And that will be, we think, a terrific boon for scholars uh, in these universities, both on the student and faculty side, and is one of the great benefits we see uh, from entering into the settlement. You know, one of the, the big trends in music that's transforming, um, you know, the 
uh, the digital nature of how what people can use it for is interactivity, and now and not and you know a lot of this came through gaming and a lot of it came from from the from rock the rock band things, but uh, the implications of interactivity with a sound file um, that is to um, develop a new system of notation like the the Beatles or the, all those rock band, which is essentially a notation a new notation that is now. I do have to interrupt you. Look, I'm I'm a board member of Activision Blizzard. We prefer Guitar Hero to rock band <laughs> when you're uh, referring to this particular. Um, uh, and, and you know, ten years ago, I, I was when I was preparing for this um, this talk, I was reading some um, uh, a future of the book uh, series of essays, um, which had a nice article by Umberto Eco, and he was then talking in '96 about you know about hypertext, and 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 he was you know very very interested in, in what those developments were of, about hypertext then. But now we've come to a completely new level of interactivity. I mean, do you do you see as as the, the rise of digital uh, books um, increases? Um, uh, do you see um, a more interactivity within those texts? So that if you if you bought the, the Divine Comedy by Dante, that was is not just a text, but it's a portal into many many other types of uh, visual and audio material, glosses, um, different kinds of you know concordances, all sorts of things. Well, I, I'm going to answer that in two ways. Uh, one way is yes, absolutely, and the other way is. Uh, uh, you know, in, in as strong terms as I can say, no. Uh, and so the yes answer is that um, there are many kinds of books that will benefit tremendously from opening themselves up to the internet, from opening themselves up to other forms of media, whether those are audible, uh, visual, et cetera, you know, and, and through the internet with linkages. I think, it, you know, this is primarily nonfiction forms for now. But you can imagine in the cookbook arena, if you have an actual video demonstration of how to make the recipe that you're looking at, that might be a valuable thing to be inherent in the book product that you're buying. Similarly, uh, if you're looking at a biology textbook uh, and there are some labs and other things that are associated with that textbook, you know, to have an interactive component to that is critical and most textbook publishers have already gone in that direction and you find uh, you know, DVD-ROMs and an awful lot in the back of a lot of these books or codes to access the internet, et cetera. That is happening as we speak and will certainly uh, continue and will be part of uh, a very, very robust, interactive, new format publishing that most publishers uh, are, are actually investing in today. However, I will say that uh, you, know, you mentioned how sticky the book is. And the, the book is a sticky format, not because of its physical nature, but because of the kind of psychological engagement that long form text reading gives. I mean, it is the key to the door of the imagination for a reason. And the moment you start peppering, for example, a fiction work with an awful lot of videos or links out or this or animations or that, you, you might necessarily actually detract from what the value of this content is, which is transporting you mentally to a different place with your imagination, not with your actual eyeballs, ears, or uh, finger to click. So, you know, I think this this has two very separate dynamics to it. One of which uh, is, you know, one of the reasons that from time, you know, from the beginning with uh, movable type, why this industry has been so sticky and why it's been such a terrific uh, industry over time is it connects with the reader's imagination in a way that no one really wants to interfere with. No one's saying, okay, text, you know, the reading of text is something that is necessarily got to change. I think everyone in the industry and an awful lot of educational researchers feel that that is something that cannot change because that's how the, the mind develops, that's how the imagination um, uh, kind of frees itself, and that's how we, you know, we have a mind's eye as a result of this kind of reading. You'd hate to, uh, you know, somehow because everything has gone interactive, everything has gone multimedia, uh, to go against that kind of, um, of thesis. What I will tell you is, you know, I, I lived through, and, and some of the people in this room will remember back when CD-ROMs, this is in, in, as in the onset of the internet, the CD-ROM market was seen as a godsend for multimedia content. Oh, we could 
we can do any kinds of books with multimedia content. You put the text on there, you can have video on there, you can have audio on there. We'll integrate it in interesting ways. Uh, we'll have encyclopedic content that will be so much richer than a print encyclopedia ever could be. And some of that has turned out to be true, but not much. So yes, you know, if you're really interested in uh, bird calls, to have a book of bird calls that actually has the bird calls somehow integrate in it is an obvious and very valuable thing. But you know, if you're looking at, uh, um, you know, at, at the history of the Ottoman Empire, it's not clear that having those elements really does add so much. Uh, and so we have, to, uh, we have to try to navigate that based on what the content is and try to maximize it for whatever content is appropriate. I'm I'm very glad that you brought that up because that was that's one of the things that that is seems um, that we're not hearing about and that is you know the the book as as the symbol of of the lifestyle or the the symbol of the liberal arts I mean and it's not just about you know the chair with the light and the the slippers and the you know the the, the reading environment that that represents but it is that it's the cognitive um, connection with text. Um, the ability to collect, uh, the ability to um, to look at books as 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 also pieces of art, and as if you were interested in old books as investments and as portals um, to history, um, and so those uh, th does that th does that st does that get mentioned in in whether it's Google or Amazon, and as they the boards of directors are meeting in these rooms. Do, does the cognitive aspect of what reading represents and, and how the mind is engaged with text as one turn, turns pages from, from, from real text, it, is that material being discussed? Uh, I'm going to say uh, no, because if you look at the reading devices that are out there today, they try to provide a simul simulacrum, more or less, of the reading of a page in a way that they would not say there's a cognitive distinction between the text you're reading on a Kindle or a Nook or another dedicated device and the kind of connection you have with a page. The idea is to make the page disappear, whether that's uh, on a printed page or on a screen, so that you're, you're absorbing the text you know, with your mind's eye with this cognitive uh, function that you described. Uh, however, on the other hand, I'm, I'm going to say that the that books as items are the intellectual furniture of our life, and and we do like to display them. We like to live with them. They're a part of us, uh, and you know that is one of the things that will keep this as a hybrid market for a long time because people want to have a kind of totemic reference to their intellectual life, which is on that shelf. Hey, these, this is me. This is what I've read. This is my intellectual life. This is what I'm interested in. People really want to show that. Um, now, you know, a lot of people think that is, uh, you know, that, that's nice to say, but it's not really true. If you look at the history of, for example, albums, uh, you know, people felt the same way about displaying their music. This is the music I listen to. This is who I am. Here's my album collection. Here's all the art in it. Here's why it's so rich. Um, and they felt that was uh, you know, easily overcome by the convenience of digital media, and nobody ended up caring. You know, if you really wanted to show somebody what kind of music you're into, you showed them what was on your computer. You showed them what was on your iPod. Um, and that may be the same thing that occurs in the print business, but again, it will occur much more slowly because of the different cohorts that we have and the, and the devotion to print for so many years on, on behalf or uh, on the part of so, such a large portion of our population. And honestly, I think books are beautiful objects in a way that uh, perhaps record albums or, or then CDs were not. I mean, typically the uh, uh, the display of a CD it was on in a rack, and you couldn't even tell what it was unless you were really up close. With books, it's a bit different. You have a bookshelf. Um, depending on whether you display them spine out or not, you can usually tell what's on there, and you can get a sense for what kind of person you're dealing with uh, by looking at their bookshelf. And and I don't think that changes so fast. Um, you know, uh, I want to bring this to academia for a second because we live, you know, a little bit in the bubble of academia in which, you know, we are not looking at the huge economic um, factors um, that, that, that you're looking at um, in, the, in the commercial world. Um, you know, we have very high-priced textbooks 
uh, for um, adoptions that can be as high as 30 to 50,000 st um, students across the country, or 100,000 if you're psychology or biology, one of those texts. Um, but we are definitely seeing pushback on the part of students. There are some disturbing trends coming out from university bookstores all across the nation, and sales are not steady. They are inching downward. They are not going up. They, students are buying fewer books. We know this. It's not a worrying trend so much because the, 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 um, the, the bottom hasn't fallen out to that extent, but it is um, continuous and it's systematic. So, so we know that. Now, th that could be a, a, a result of a number of things. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to put your finger on one of them. But the web has become so active as a, as a place where material is logged um, and lodged. Uh, there are, um, there is a, the, the price is becoming very prohibitive. Um, students have complained. There's articles in the New York Times about the prices of textbooks. We've heard all of these. It's, it's inconceivable now to, to charge as much as we used to charge. We're trying to find ways around it. Do you have any idea of, of how the academic world is going to have to try to manage this, um, you know, this 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 situation. Uh, we, you know, both in, in in a slightly decreasing sales, which could mean something, and how we were able to provide content, um, and still, you know, enjoy the same cognitive advantages of having the, the hard copy book, but try to do that on an economically, um, you know, prudent uh, basis. Okay, I'm going to try to address myself to this. It's a it's a very controversial topic because honestly, the if you look at the net cost of the typical book to the typical student, it is not the list price of the book. The net cost is, uh, on average, more far more used textbooks are purchased by students than new, and uh, students. The majority of students sell back their textbooks at the end of the usage period, whether that's a semester or some other period. Um, so if you look at the net cost of a textbook, uh, it is really disconnected from the, the so-called list price or retail price of the book. I do think that uh, uh, the market dynamics, that is the college bookstore reselling of used textbook, has has forced publishers to price more and more aggressively on those books that they are able to sell, which is, you know, if you've got 10,000 students for a particular course for a textbook, you know you're only, and, and, it, and it's a, uh, uh, a multi-year phenomenon, it's not just a one-year uh, phenomenon, this book, you're going to only be selling about a third of them or less. Uh, you only sell 3,000 copies for those 10,000 students in any given year because they'll be recycling the rest of the books. Therefore, you've got to, You've got to try to uh, you know, price it in such a way that you can maintain your business and your margins. And I, and I am certainly sympathetic to those educational publishers who are trying to puzzle this out. We now have a kind of Netflix model where you can rent textbooks. And you don't even have to buy them and resell them. Uh, a company called Chegg, and I think there are a couple of other companies that are, are pursuing that. So there are ways to get uh, students into a net price, perhaps, that's more reasonable. Um, even though you have a very high uh, sort of headline price that the New York Times says, oh my God, this textbook for biology is $130. Can you believe that? Well, I mean, the net price of the students may be more like $35, $40, uh, and maybe that's still too high. Um, I think one of the reasons that, uh, that digital formats are so interesting is you can still get a lot of the benefits of a textbook, but the highest cost elements, which are, for example, uh, you know, the, uh, the kind of extensive and expansive views, the color, you know, all of this other stuff that might uh, not be core to some of the teaching, you can actually offload to online and actually not burden the cost of the book with that kind of material. Uh, you know, you can do all of the assessment and workbook and lab stuff certainly online. And, and I know a lot of publishers feel that there are students who will just prefer to have online access to this, uh, you know, to this material, and prefer to pay a lot less to have such access than they would pay to have a sort of permanent copy in print, and they're going to enable that. They are today with uh, efforts like Course Smart and others. Uh, you know, there are electronic versions of these books that are somewhat less expensive than the uh, printed versions. But I think you're going to look at hybrid. There'll be very few textbooks that are just print. 
Uh, I mean, there'll be some in humanities and other areas, but most of them will have a print component and an online component. Uh, and together, that will form the work that a student will be able to get. And that student will be able to get that on a used basis, perhaps with just the portion that's online being able to be purchased separately for a fairly small amount of money uh, over time. That, that's how I see the economics of this uh, working out. Ultimately, I think universities are going to look at uh, taking the burden away from students for this kind of expenditure and bundle it into uh, to the tuition fees, as, as a few universities have already done, and say, look, if you come here, all the books you need are going to be site licensed essentially across the university, and we're going to give you whatever materials you, you need to pursue whatever academics you want to pursue here, and that is X amount on your tuition, so it doesn't appear to come out of gee, am I going to spend this much money on beer, or am I going to spend this much money on textbooks? Hell, I'll borrow somebody else's textbook. I want the beer money. I, I think we're going to take that equation away, ultimately, and this will be more of a subscription uh, uh, institutional type of environment. But that's going to take many years but, to get to. But we're having those conversations already. You're right. I'm just going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to turn this over to the audience. We have a microphone set up um, in the center aisle, and I know that um, there are a lot of questions that I think people would like to answer, because we have a very different kinds of people. We have um, people from the library here. We have people from the, from, the, from the bookstore. We have professors. We have students. And we have visitors from, from, from across the, um, the city. Uh, the green aspect. I mean, we haven't talked much about, about this today, but obviously um, with, with a, a, a digital environment, uh, we are looking at a significant decrease in the amount of, of paper that's being used, the amount of weight, the transportation costs. I mean, you know, the implications of, 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 of digitization are, are so far reaching at all, um, at all points in that circuit of, of the history of, of, of any one book. Uh, how is that playing out, um, and is that, a, is that a, a persuasive case to be made for, you know, the, the much greater digitization? Well, I, I think you can make a lot of this, but I, I'm not sure where it nets out. Uh, I mean, we, most publishers use sustainable forests now for the vast majority of what they uh, print. And so there's, I mean, it's not an ecological disaster like hardwood forests would be where we're, you know, cutting down stuff that is never going to regrow. Uh, I think there is an energy usage argument, you know, with regard to transportation of all this material. And, you know, there's some oil usage in the inks, et cetera. And you can kind of build up what is the model of, uh, you know, what's the model of sustainability disadvantage from having all these books. There's also sustainability disadvantage from having electronic devices, as you well know. The, uh, both the manufacture of and particularly the disposal of these devices is an ecological issue of some scale, as, is, uh, you know, th as are things like batteries and electricity uses, et cetera. Uh, there's not a lot of electricity actually used. Once you buy a book, you know, you're turning the pages using your own mechanical energy. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I honestly, I, I don't know if anyone's even looked into it, but I'm not sure exactly where all of this nets out. I imagine that it's going to be a lot better ecologically to be distributing this stuff digitally, and, you know, even if potentially parts of it are printed out, uh, than it will be to be trucking it from here to there and uh, and producing it, uh, you know, in a uh, offset. Uh, print kind of manufacturing facility, but I, I don't feel that it is a huge win if you compare it against the energy usage and the uh, sustainability effects of almost any other industry that you look at. I mean, this industry is just not so big in terms of the amount of tonnage that we use. It might be, you know, for example, one day of bottled water. I mean, I, probably not even. Uh, that is the entire industry for a year. So, uh, you know, I, I think we've got to uh, try to figure out here, you know, w what should be driving what. I'm not sure that should be driving a lot, although I think we ought to be sensitive to it. Okay, I'd like to open this up um, to, uh, for, to questions. So if you would um, like to line up here at the, um, at the microphone, we have some people coming up. And, and if, it would be um, nice if you could identify yourself as well. I'm from Dublin City University. Um, Can you hear, Richard? Hi. Okay. Hi. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm a professor of history of ideas. Um, I'm, I'd like to speak as an author. 
and I'm becoming less and less sympathetic with the proprietary interests of book publishers. Um, as authors, uh, we do the research, we do the thinking, we do the writing, and now we're actually producing digital copy as well. And I'm really looking for a model uh, which makes this material more and more open access. Um, I don't think the role of, of hard copy publishers is going to be in the future uh, what it has been in the past. I ver I'm very pleased about the, uh, the Google Book project. I, saw, I read an article in the paper and then I went on to Google Books and I saw a number of my books listed. As, um, I, I, I like the idea of them being there. Um, authors don't actually, aren't really the ones that make that much money um, out of some of these books anyway. But I was particularly interested in my first book which I wrote by hand, and I, I don't possess digital copy of it myself. And uh, so I was particularly keen. I saw this had been digitized at University of Michigan, but I go on and I can only, I can search it all right, but I can only get snippets of it. So I asked Google, first of all, I wrote to them and said, could I please have a, co a digital copy of my own book? And they said, no, it wasn't their practice at the moment to do that, but they urged me to join uh, Google Partners. But it's, it's actually my publisher who has the call as to whether that book becomes accessible. And it's not even my original publisher. It's a publisher that bought out the list of my original publisher. They've never communicated with me. Um, they've never given me royalties. And, and yet they still have the say over whether this book becomes accessible or not. Anyway, I want to de deal with that. I want to say a word or two about uh, as, as a reader. Um, I've got a Sony reader there in my bag. Uh, I came over from Ireland, and it's really nice to have dozens of books in the one device instead of all these heavy things that used to fill the bottom of my suitcase and make um, much other stuff I could bring very problematic. But the proprietary practices of the publishers of ebooks are really outrageous. I can't, buy, I, I can't buy anything from Amazon on it. Because I brought my Sony device in Ireland, I can't even buy ebooks from the, the Sony store in the USA. And they're absurdly priced. Some of the prices of ebooks are, are the, the prices of um, hardbacks. And they don't, you know, what do, what do they cost book publishers to produce? So there are just some of my comments at the moment, both as, as an author and as a reader. OK. Well, well, thanks. I'll try to deconstruct those comments and figure out if there's a question in there anywhere. Um, uh, what, well, the first place to address myself to is you know, to your issues as, as an author. Um, with uh, you know, our, our experiences that publishers uh, experiences that authors really want two things. One is they want their books to be read, and the other is that they want to be paid for their work. Um, now, I think many academic authors would be very happy with an open source solution because they're not that interested in being paid for their work, and those authors should avail themselves of that open source solution. They can post their book up on Scribd or uh, you know, ultimately on Google or anywhere else and, and have that book sit out there for the public to read to its heart's content. Um, I, I don't really see any restriction on that today, nor should I think there ever would be an, uh, any restriction on that. Where a publisher has gotten involved with the work, the publisher is making an investment in the work, both uh, perhaps in a prepayment to the author and then certainly in producing the work, editing the work, marketing the work, uh, and distributing the work, the publisher does have a, uh, uh, you know, a right to achieve a return on the investment that it is making, and therefore the publisher typically charges something for the book and will continue to charge something for the book. Uh, and I don't really see a change in that model either, um, you know, so long as publishers are paying authors for books. What, what I do think is, uh, you know, is, is pretty interesting and potentially compelling in, in what you said is that uh, ultimately, Publishers need to, and, and authors as well, the entire market needs to service readers here, uh, not to service companies that are looking for lock-in models, such as perhaps a Sony reader in Ireland, saying, OK, you can only buy books for this reader, and only in Ireland. If you're in the United States, you can't do it. You can't do it for any other devices. We need to have market standards that are better than that, so that um, uh, people aren't locked into particular devices or particular retailers or potentially to particular geographies. 
so that they can you know pursue their reading to their heart's content uh, you know without those kinds of impedances because otherwise we'll end up in a situation as I said before where piracy may have a, a better chance of taking root than otherwise um, in terms of the uh, you know the overall pricing of ebooks I think it, it should be understood that the publisher is not pricing ebooks the retailers are so Amazon or uh, in, in your case, perhaps Sony is putting a price on those books. We are selling it to Sony for something. We are selling it to Amazon for something. They are deciding how much to sell it to uh, the consumer for. That is not something we can get involved with, you know, legally in the United States, at least. We can't set a retail price to the consumer. So if you have, you know, issues with the pricing, it should really be issues with Amazon. Our issues honestly go the other way. Amazon's selling an awful lot of our books for such a cheap number, you know, for $9.99, that we're concerned that the value of those books will leak out, uh, that people won't ascribe the kind of value we think is inherent in the content uh, to those books. The best sellers at Amazon, you know, are, are uh, typically priced at $9.99, and that's requiring all their competitors to price it that way. Even now in the retail market for printed books, Walmart, Target, uh, uh, and Amazon are each pricing their printed bestsellers at $8.98 so they can compete, you know, better with, uh, with the electronic editions and better with the attention of the consumers. And this is, we think, creating a long-term value prob problem for, uh, you know, for our bestsellers. And, and we would prefer to keep the perceived value of books at a high level rather than a low level because we think that books do have uh, a high inherent value and we do invest a lot in making great books. And uh, you know, honestly, what does it cost to make a book? The manufacturing costs of books, except for certain kinds of textbooks, ends up being a fairly small portion of the publisher's cost. The vastly larger portion is the amount that's invested in editing, in packaging, in distributing, in um, uh, in marketing, in co-op funding of, of the retail uh, environments so the book can get out there, all of those things are a bigger number, particularly put together. They're many times the number, typically, of the just printing and binding costs that we have. So uh, yes, e-books are not going to have the printing and binding costs. But yes, e-books are going to have all those other costs. And some of those costs may be higher. It may be more expensive to market a digital book, ultimately, than it has been to market a book in print between covers. Next question. Hi. Um, I've been told to face this way. I hope this is appropriate. <laughs> uh, yeah. My name's Wendy Gordon. I'm the Beck Professor of Law here at Boston University. And my question is about um, the distribution of digital texts as computer files. Um, when that possibility first got raised, there was a lot of excitement that handicapped children and adults would be able to adapt uh, digital files to their handicaps, whether it be something as simple as making uh, print larger or adapting it in other ways to make it more handleable for people whose uh, perceptions had difficulties. Um, at the same time, I had heard from the publishers, or at least some, that there was a lot of worry that the particular copy that was sent out let's say, to help the uh, short-sighted, uh, nearly blind person might get co-opted um, and turned into fodder for illegal distribution. Um, the usual way to protect against those things, of course, are either copyright law or digital rights management, but you can't exactly put a cryptolope around a digital file that you want somebody to use and adapt. So I wonder if you have any comments on how well the great potential for educating the handicapped has proceeded in the digital environment and how you're dealing with some of the um, issues I mentioned. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, it, it's, it's a great question. Uh, to be honest with you, starting with the locking down of these files and the DRM, um, in our judgment, at least at Random House and at Bertelsmann, 
this is going to be an environment for a very light DRM touch, not for heavy locking DRM that are, that's hard to break and that you know you have the NSA uh, codes working on, etc. And the reason is that anyone who really wants to post a digital file simply has to scan the text from a printed book and post the digital file. And we found when we did the Dan Brown book, for example, that you know the, the day it went on sale, there were dozens and dozens of people who had decided, for whatever reason they had, to scan these things with home scanners and post the book as PDF files up on a whole variety of different sites. Uh, that was somewhat annoying to us, and we had to issue some takedown notices. But that shows you how you really cannot lock these digital files of books in a way that will keep them forever locked, because anyone can just scan from the page. Uh, what we have done and what we've, uh, we've tried to do over time for uh, those with, with disabilities, mostly sight disabilities, uh, but some others as well, uh, is to you know, is to work with the various societies to make sure our material is both accessible and usable by each of these groups. So we do have programs that um, uh, that have all of our works available to people who are sight impaired. We have audio versions that are available, uh, and uh, and we support all the audio text equipment that's out there. I think that there's no question that the digitizing of this material is leading to. Uh, a phenomenally better access for these groups than they ever had before. In fact, for example, the, the Google Book Project has a whole section on accessibility, and these, you know, and we're talking about millions of titles that certainly would have never, no one would have invested in even digitizing before, much less making these available uh, to people with sight impairments uh, or other disabilities. So I think there is a, you know, it's a remarkable trend and, and will only accelerate from here forward in terms of giving this kind of accessibility to those with disabilities. Any other questions? Yes, we have w one more question. It will be a quick one. Um, I'm a, a professor of Arabic at uh, Yale University, and I'm dealing with texts that uh, um, are important for a number of centuries, even millennia. I'm worried about obsolescence and about uh, formats uh, that can be preserved in, in libraries. And paper is a wonderful material. I guess there are two formats in uh, the States and in Europe, the uh, letter size. But uh, are we safe with uh, things like PDF? How long will that format be valid, legible? How, how often will university libraries have to reformat uh, their entire holdings? And will there be something like a non-commercial or at least broadly available format that's accessible for everybody that is not controlled commercially by any company that can suddenly go out of uh, business? Is, is there a possibility of enough people getting together and creating an, an open format that is um, um, has longevity. Thank you. That's a, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge, well, paper is a terrific format. It is not exactly a permanent format. You know, we've had many floods in libraries and fires and other things that have shown just how vulnerable paper can be, although it's been a terrific format over the centuries in general. Um, once digitized, uh, you know, I think there are a few things to rest assured about. The first is that the there is no chance that the sort of uh, there's only one master and that thing is going to get melted in an explosion. There are multiple masters that are being made, and in fact, each of the libraries that has supplied the original books to the Google program are getting masters of the books they supplied back that they're storing uh, for archival purposes. And then Google is going to have some Iron Mountain storage uh, outside of its facilities, etc. As far as the format itself, that is PDF. And this is PDF both with a photography layer and a text layer. Uh, by a photography layer, I simply mean an image of the page, and a text layer, meaning the, the, the text contained on the page. Both of those are being, uh, you know, are separable and are being stored. And I don't think there is any chance, and if you talk to any technologist, they'll agree, there is no chance that a subsequent format post PDF will not come along with a black box translation format for you to pour in, and I mean millions of PDFs, and in a couple of hours get the new format for all of those 
materials. In other words, we're not going to have a new format show up where you can't translate in a very easy, rapid, and automatic way from the previous format that we're storing in now, uh, which is primarily PDFs for this material, but other formats you know, for other kinds of documents. Um, and uh, you know, I think if you look at bitmap images and other kinds of things, those will very similarly have have uh, black box porting to whatever the next format is for storing of those image types. So I think we can we can be pretty confident that that is not going to be a, a major issue or affliction of uh, technological progress. I mean, it's interesting because I mean, even now there's still there are there are problems. You know, whether you're using Acrobat or you're using Preview on the Mac or things like that. There's some things that that translate well. Some things don't translate well. I mean, there's still a, it's still a kind of uneven playing field. It's 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 a little bit rocky out there in terms of an industry standard that accepts you know that you know um, all of these all you know documents and images and things like that. So so the um, you know any kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, systemization of all of that, I think, is is um, is, uh, is is going to be great. Are there any are there any other questions? We might have time for one quick one. Yes, and then we'll, it's too bad you can't come to our reception, Richard, because we would like to talk to you more about this. Uh, I'd love to be there. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Vital Izakura, and I'm from the Harvard University Library. I was just wondering. Um, so back in 2005, Google had this idea about electronic book renting, kind of like renting uh, movies from Netflix. I don't know whatever happened with that, but how how do publishers feel about using that kind of strategy to uh, recoup their costs? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'll give you a few different answers to that. I mean, there are a lot of new economic models that we can look at. Rental is certainly one of them, and and uh, I think uh, rental of textbooks where you know you're going to use it for a fixed period actually makes a lot of sense. Subscriptions are another one where you can potentially, let's say you're a science fiction reader, you can subscribe to the entire library of science fiction works from everybody uh, you know, and read as much as you want. For now, the a la carte model of figuring out what book you want to read and buying that book or buying access to that book electronically is, is the way the industry is going because the economics essentially dictate it. And, and this is not anything to, uh, you know, I mean, this is a very difficult issue. We have contracts with our authors as an industry. Those contracts are based on having certain kinds of purchase models. And were we to go with a rental model, the contract doesn't contemplate it, and we would then have to negotiate, and I mean tens of thousands of separate negotiations, with the authors or their agents to figure out, OK, how do we compensate you for this particular economic activity? The reason that a purchase and sale model has tended to be the model we've gone with in digital sales so far is largely because that is the model that the industry acknowledges through its contracts can be done. Uh, and especially for a vast backlist, it is a daunting thing to even think about trying to go back and renegotiate each of these contracts that you may have entered into, uh, you know, some of them 20 years ago, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to figure out how you can enable uh, something like a rental model uh, to happen. However, I will tell you that uh, the Nook, for example, by Barnes & Noble has a a feature in it where if you have bought a book, you can lend it to a friend for up to 14 days, I think it is. Uh, and during that time, you won't have access to it, but your friend will. And after that time, it kind of returns to your library. Uh, so there will be different ways that I think we can expose these different economic models. But it's going to take some time, and it's going to take some structural change in terms of how the industry uh, papers over its agreement with authors, with retailers, et cetera. Uh, but I'd like to thank everybody. Those are terrific questions, and I've really enjoyed uh, uh, having a chance to talk to you. I'm sorry I couldn't be there physically. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Richard. I, I think I can speak for all of us um, in saying that we feel very privileged to have had this kind of access to you um, and uh, to have you answer um, you know, the questions and, and to provide some uh, some big, you know, sort of big picture uh, views about what's taking place in, you know, this in, in enormously dynamic, dynamic industry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we very much appreciate it. Thank you, Victor.